Hello Unicorn! If you want to make an entry into non-heteronormative identities, this episode provides you with biochemical as well as sociological definitions of gender, sex and LGBTQ+. So what does LGBTQ plus stand for? L is for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, T for trans, Q for queer, and the plus stands for more variety within the realm of non-heteronormativity. While the LGB stands for, well, sexual orientation, transgender does not, and queerness does not have to be either. But to understand all of these concepts, we need to clarify first what gender means. Gender is a social cultural attribution of what a specific sex has to be like in behavior, in how they present themselves, and also how they communicate. It is a cultural construct that varies throughout the world. And in some cultures, it is more flexible and fluid, and in others, more stringent. Gender can be descriptive, meaning how we traditionally attribute a set of characteristics and behavioral patterns to either men or women. And it can be prescriptive, which means which kind of sex-specific behavior they should show. In a country with a mainly binary gender order, descriptive attributions can look like this. Men are sexually active, strong, the breadwinner, and protector of the family. Women are emotional, sexually passive, and caring for family and relationships. A prescriptive gender norm now implies men have to be strong in any situation, they cannot show weakness, and they have to avoid by any chance everything that's considered female. For example, being emotional or being caring. This concept is also sometimes referred to as toxic masculinity, which I will dedicate an own episode to in the future. For a woman, on the other hand, it means she will get socially and possibly also juristically punished for being sexually active, demanding her place in the workspace, and for not fulfilling her caring role, for example, as a mother. All clear? <laughs> well, then let's move to the biological sex. This matter is a little bit more complicated. Humans, as many other animals, are considered to be a species of sexual dimorphism, meaning that there are differences in appearance of the sexes. You can see sexual dimorphism, for example, very clearly in male and female ducks, other birds, and also lions. Keep in mind, though, that the differences in male and female bodies are not sufficiently researched yet at all. A topic that we will talk about in a gender data gap episode in the future. And B, that the dichotomy of the binary world is not necessarily always clear in those biological markers, as we are genetically and in our development so diverse that the idea that there is only one female and only one biological makeup for males is simply misleading. Now that we have that covered, is homosexuality or transgender a choice then, or rather encoded in us? Stick with me, brave travelers, we are diving deeper into the sea of science. <laughs> Our genetic blueprint consists of one genome with 23 pairs of chromosomes. One of them bears the marker XX or XY, which we consider sex markers, XX for women and XY for men. Every chromosome then has one DNA molecule, which has four nucleotides. The order and makeup of those nucleotides make our genetical blueprint so individual. By means of genotyping, which basically means reading the genomes and localizing so-called SNPs, the parts of the DNA where nucleotides are different, and by the way, those SNPs make up 90% of our differences, scientists try to locate SNPs that could predict homosexual tendencies. The polygenic score indeed found some SNPs in which specific well, combinations of genes increase the chance of homosexual attraction. However, this study looked at people acting out on that attraction. So probe and swear to simply ask if they engaged in same-sex intercourse. And thus, it cannot rule out human characteristics such as an eventual spirit, um, general curiosity, or open-mindedness, which do not necessarily say something about well, your sexual preferences at all. Furthermore, the polygenic score could only explain 1% of the differences. So to sum up the findings, sexual orientation is written in our genes, which means it is not simply a lifestyle choice. Simultaneously, though, that inscription is in its significance so tiny that it cannot be used against non-heterosexuals as being something abnormal or considerably different. 
Moreover, genetic is not the same as biological. A genetic makeup is a stiff construct that, unless you use techniques such as CRISPR, cannot be changed. The term biological, however, also includes environmental influences, which can constantly change our makeup. Our brain, for example, literally changes its composition every time we learn something new. And hormones are influenced so heavily by what we do and by environmental impact that they too can change our development. What about transgender then though? Well, there are several problems with scientific conclusions here. Firstly, there's only a minimal amount of studies available with only a few probands. Transgender people are making up less than 1% of the population, and even fewer of them want to participate in studies about their identity. Secondly, most transgender studies are focused on brain structures, which is problematic since the brain, as stated before, is constantly changing, which means it is hard to determine what is genetic and what is influenced by environmental factors. Moreover, the correlation with gender plays a role. How we perceive gender and gender-coded behavioral patterns interacts with the makeup of our brains. Again, the brain is formed constantly by our thoughts and actions. And lastly, correlation does not mean cause. Let me cook up a story here real quick. Let's say we find out that transgender men have a flower-shaped brain. Then we cannot automatically conclude that the flower shape is the reason for the transgender identity, nor can we say that a transgender man identity actively shapes the brain to a flower. Scientifically speaking, we can only say, hey, that is a noticeable difference. There is a correlation, but we do not know the cause. By definition, transgender means that the attributed biological sex does not fit with the biological composition of the brain. Studies have shown that there is no such thing as the typical male or the typical female brain. Indeed, as with a lot of things, we are on a scale and most of us are in terms of our brain composition closer to the middle, so a brain with no significant gendered markers, than on the ends with stronger specific markers. We have learned that it is hard to determine what is genetical and what is biological, and to what extent current studies of transgender identity are problematic. And with that being said, studies have shown that if we isolate specific brain regions and compare those of transgender and cis people, transgender brains are in their makeup closer to the cisgender they identify with than their transcribed biological sex, which is interesting. But there's of course a catch that pointing out a correlation of specific brain regions does not explain a complete identity and it simplifies the complexity of the topic. However, we can say that a transgender identity has something to do with biology and neurology. And once again, we can come to the conclusion it is nothing unnatural. Now that we've covered gender, biological sex, homosexuality and transgender identity, let's have a look at the cue for queerness. Queer used to be an insult for homosexual people, until it was reclaimed by the LGBTQ community in the 1990s. Queer means a sexual orientation, gender identity, appearance or actions that differ from the cisgender heteronormativity. The term queer can thus be seen as an umbrella for other sexual and gender identities, such as pansexuals, pangender, asexuals and agender, gender fluid, or cross-gender, which simplify describes the behavior and or appearance of a person according to the gender norm of the opposite sex. Transvestism falls under that term. However, be careful that you do not confuse cross-gender practices or gender identity with sexuality. They do not have to correspond in any way whatsoever. The best way of broadening your horizon in any way is to get in touch with the LGBTQ plus community and to learn from them, as well as ask what kind of terms they prefer. In a nutshell though, the term queer embraces the whole spectrum. Another topic that is covered within LGBTQ plus and that I want to put emphasis on is intersex people, also sometimes referred to as hermaphrodites, which goes back to Greek mythology and the child of Hermes and Aphrodite, who merged the two sexes in himself. 
Intersex babies are born with genitals and other visual markers that doctors and midwives cannot clearly attribute to a category of male or female biological sex. And that happens way more often than you might think. Up until one of thousand kids are born intersex with a probably higher number of unreported cases. Intersex serves as an umbrella term for very different clinical phenomena with different biological causes. What they do have in common though most of the time is a sex assignment surgery that they could not consent on and that most of the time is also conducted without the consent and proper medical clarification of the parents. A surgery that can cause long-term complications and is a massive violation of the human right of physical integrity only to uphold the polarizing dichotomy of the masculine versus the feminine. Here we can see the horrors of what happens when the binary system does not allow any deviation of what is deemed proper and normal. Keep in mind that what is considered an anatomic abnormality or variation depends on what is culturally defined so. Non-European cultures have long known gender fluid identities or even a third sex, such as the Native American Two-Spirit, the Kathoe or Shemel in Thailand, the Fafaina in Samoa and the Mahu in French Polynesia and Hawaii, etc. The Bugis in Sulawesi even have five genders and in pre-colonization Africa, cross-gender religious leaders existed among the Otoro, the Meru and Kukuyu in Kenya and the Hutu and Tutsi in Burundi and Rwanda. Due to the rather Eurocentric division of the world into two sexes and genders, intersex until this day is still medically classified as a disorder of sex development, or short a DSD. So how can we wrap this episode up? <laughs> well, first of all, very, very easy, don't stigmatize, because how we simplify our world often fails to represent the lived reality and identity of many, many individuals. From this episode, though, we can conclude that Contrasting biological sex with sociocultural gender simplifies the complexity of the topic. It rejects that our biology cannot be detached from societal gender norms. Furthermore, we need to keep in mind that the interpretation of scientific findings as well as the initial research question on which studies are based are spawned by humans that are socialized in specific ways. Thus, as long as there's a human factor in research, there is no such thing as a completely objective scientific result, since we're all pre-programmed by society's values and viewing angles. Next week, I have a brand new episode prepared for you, in which we will be diving into the history of the LGBTQ plus movement. Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell if you do not want to miss out on that. <laughs> Until then, thank you so much for watching and have a sparkling, colorful day. Visitas, bye bye.